Welcome, day 82, Songbringer, Zelda-like game, day 82. Man, the progress made every week is so, so incredible, so much progress. Um, this last week, we've been creating this boss. I've been creating this boss, and people have been chatting and helping out with suggestions and encouragement, and thanks for all the love. <laughs> about that volume so this guy yeah he's pretty awesome it's fun to fight there's these little health um, things over here now I changed health from oranges to shark teeth or I, they're actually called demon tooths demon teeth there's a little more juice now so you notice when I get hit there's like a um, there's sort of like a dust kick up effect. So I was almost dead there. I had to get, at least get it some more health. Got him! With half a heart left. Wow. So, yeah, one issue with him turning to stone is that he kind of blocks the view of something sometimes, like. He's blocking the view of this demon's tooth, but he's not technically blocking any doors ever. And I made sure his collision box is not doing anything like that. I just think it's pretty cool to have a boss like looking like this when he dies. It's kind of like a trophy in the sense that you've accomplished that. You can you can like go back into this room at a later point and be like, oh yeah, I already killed that guy. So that's pretty cool. And this is the room with the top hat. Oh, I guess we already have the top hat. Yeah, I already had the top hat. Because I've already killed this guy a bunch of times before. But yeah, so um, today's goal for today's stream is I'm working on Perlin noise for creating a, a really um, procedurally generated overworld. And Perlin noise is helping me create multiple terrain, like, randomly generated, procedurally generated terrain. So I'm gonna to go to my desktop. I have a I have this code set up so that it creates some Perlin noise and then um, applies some gradients, some cones to it, and then outputs it all into some data and then saves a, an image to my desktop. So this is the Perlin noise I've created so far. Oh yeah, I had it on whoops. I had it on cone mode, so I was just showing the cone part. So if I turn that off right there, it'll show you the Perlin noise. And what's cool is um, I found a great article for Perlin noise online. And I'll share that with you here in a second. And then I'm, I've modified it to use my own random number generator. And I've added a bunch of other features as well so far. But this is what the Perlin noise looks like at first. So, actually I'm going to copy this to... Call this Perlin zero. So I can refer to this again in the stream if anyone else is watching and curious about how this process is working. Black Iron, what's up man? So, this is what the Perlin noise looks like. We're um, Black Iron we're generating terrain for the overworld right now. So this is a procedurally generated Perlin noise thing that uses the random number generator in my game so that it's actually referring to um, your mega seed code. So because I have mega seed code HAP, it always will create this exact Perlin noise every single time. And uh, if I change my code, so if I change it to something else and run it again, it will have a different noise. So if we change it just to like the letter H, run the game again, you notice it changed the world there also. But then I go and view the Perlin noise. There's a different one. And so if I change it back, it'll always create the exact same Perlin noise every time. So I'm stoked about that. It's a good foundation for building some procedurally generated terrain. So there's that old one. And now um, 
I can step them as well. Yeah, it's the procedure. It's totally the overworld is going to be procedurally generated. Right now, it is. It's got, it's got an overworld maze it generates, but I really want to do this overworld terrain as well. So there'll be multiple different heights to things. So, like, um, if I threshold it, you'll see kind of what it is. So this threshold basically divides 256 colors up into just six colors. So you can see different heights to the terrain. So there, that's kind of, um, yeah, yeah, but they're different algorithms. So the dungeons kind of have their own algorithm and then the overworld kind of has its own algorithm because the overworld has the basically just outdoors. And so, yeah, so this, this white bit here is the top of a mountain. The next part is, you know, lower and lower and lower. And then these dark parts are going to be water. And um, here's the Perlin noise generator that I'm actually using uh, where here's the link I use so it's solarianprogrammer.com Perlin noise there's the URL but this is a he actually has a github project he explains how he, his Perlin noise generator works and I really like the way he did it because he did it with an actual seed, so so that way I could actually write, um, kind of rewrite this for my own code and use my own um, random number generator so that I can make sure that it's always the same no matter what platform or what, as, all, as long as it has the same mega seed. So, and it's also very, very simple. It's just one simple class, Perlin Noise, and um, these other two classes are PPM to Oxford uh, PPM image, and these are demo classes. So this is a really cool link if anybody else is on this stream and looking at doing their own procedurally generated terrain. So the next step, what I really want to do to this is to make it, um, make these, the as it goes from one terrain height to another, I want the, I want it to create some cliff edges. So basically, the generator will take something like this cliff edge and will create some actual cliff height. So this this darker gray part I'm drawing in right here will actually be a cliff cliff tiles. So actually working with the Perlin noise generator and then drawing these in before I ever actually go and turn this into tiles for the game. It, it really, really is cool to get this all dialed in first because that way it's just going to make it way easier when I do get to actually generating terrain. So let's throw in, I've got a couple more bits to this algorithm I'm working on. One is this Y gradient. Let me show you what that looks like if I enable that. So there, it kind of creates a, it creates mountains more in the top, and water down below. So, yeah, so I really do want to make a couple more things too, like a river. And this is all, all totally inspired by MetaZelda. So once again, I got to plug this because MetaZelda is... Awesome. It's so cool that Tom Coxon shared all of how his algorithms work for not only how he, how he generates procedural dungeons, but how he does procedural overworlds as well. So here's a good to a good few articles here. If you click on that, if you search for MetaZelda and then you follow through to his website and his blog articles, he's got some really great articles on overworld generation as well as procedurally generated dungeons and stuff. Here's a dungeon article, Lock and Key Puzzle Generation. That's a great article to read. And then also these ones, Overworld Generation Part 1. This shows how he um, does his. And in general, a lot, I'm going to kind of use the same style of generating this Perlin noise as well. It's kind of how he's doing it. 
Um, but then how my game will be unique is in how it actually applies it to the tiles in the game. So I really want to do some cool cliffs. And my art's a lot different than his his art for Lena's Inception. Lena's Inception is really really cool game. Um, I bought this game. This is so great. So and he he's working on it even more. So he's got a lot of progress. He's making like check it out. He just posted an update. He's he's hired a guy to do some more pixel art for it. But it's sort of a Zelda Game Boy style art. And um, my game is more of you know more more gritty, a little more gritty art, more. 32-bit art so um, yeah so it's gonna be totally different as mine as my actual game applies the tiles to this it'll look a lot different so but once again I'm very very inspired by this and very very thankful that he shared all this stuff because it really makes it a lot faster for me to kind of do the same thing or but you know do it in my own way basically so thanks again Tom um, so yeah, and one thing I, I want to do that's different too is waterfalls and and flowing water. So, like, water can start, like, like let's say the water will start, like, right there where this water bit starts. And um, it will, like, connect to the sea like this. You know? This is how a river would be created. And... I'd like for the for these bits like right up here, this bit, this bit. Whenever the water would actually change terrain heights, I want it to do a waterfall. So technically this water up here in the top is actually at a higher level. This is like a mountain pond or a mountain lake. And this is more of like a, a midlands pond or lake. And then this is like the lowlands inlet from the sea so yeah so the next step is I want to do I actually really want to hook this all up into the the game and start getting it to do tiles for all this so the first step to that is gonna be making cliffs so I'm gonna do start doing some algorithms so it will actually draw in these cliffs to the output and these cliffs will just at first just be rock tiles for the overworld. So let's get to doing that. I'm going to have to go and loop over all of the output. So at first we're going to be doing, we're going to do multiple passes on this. Um, so we're not going to need to set up the data for a minute or the offset. So actually I'm going to call this bit data, this is just going to be width times height. And we can do data offset plus plus equals n. And this, we're going to block off this bit of code here and create a different variable for storing the image data.
So all this code right here is basically just saving the image. I'm separating these out so I can do multiple passes. So one pass will be thresholding. Another pass will be adding cliffs. The last pass will be exporting the data and saving it. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure this is still working here. What's up, Zoomis? Hello, long shorts. Oh, cool. Let me check this out. Um, I wonder if this is similar. Hmm. Yep, cool. This is almost exactly how um, how the Meta Zelda was doing it as well, and how I'm going to do it as well. So, cool article. I'll save this link. But I'm pretty sure I'm already on that same page, so that's cool. So it was thanks, man. Yeah, I'm glad he worked out cool too. I'll actually I'll play him again here in a second, so you guys can get a see what he looks like now. Actually, I'll play him right now, see if that actually worked with the Perlin noise. Okay, what's uh, wrong with this? Inf. Int. I've learned how to how to fight him pretty well now at this point I can pretty much beat him if I want to this is good I think if um he's still really challenging if I don't if I don't watch myself like I'm already down to half health so I'm down to like only one star health now so I got to get a, a demon tooth there these little chests now work too so they're just one hit and they open up oh got him nice yeah, so he's um he's looking a lot better, and I really like using the teeth better than the oranges. So now it's it's a demon's tooth that you pick up, which gives you more courage, and basically that's your life containers, your life and your health in the game is demon teeth. Oranges were kind of the same thing. You're supposed to, but I just don't think oranges represented courage very well. So that's why I went with the demon's teeth. Cool, man. Way to go building a game solo. I respect that. Big time. Cool. So what I'm going to be doing now is, let's see if, uh, first, let's see if that Perlin noise is still how it was. Yes. Good. Okay, so I didn't mess anything up in the multi-pass there, what I just did. And so the next step is going to be taking this second pass and add, adding in cliffs. So do, I'm going to do a whole other pass on the data. Sweet. Nice, man. Yeah, well, um, pretty soon I'll be doing some music for the, the Kickstarter video I'm going to be working on. So maybe, you know, you'll learn a few things about how music is made as well, too. Help you do even more solo awesomeness. But then again, it's so easy to purchase music these days, and there's so many musicians out there putting their music up. So it's not necessarily something you have to learn anymore. But it is very satisfying to make your own music for a game and make your own total aesthetic. 
It's really, really fun. <clears throat> nice. Good for you picking up the bamboo tablet, man. I like I said a million times, I've I struggled with art as well in the past, and thankfully I just picked up the pen and just started learning and soaked up a bunch of YouTube videos on speed pixel art and now I feel like I can do it. Okay, so adding in cliffs, we're gonna go whenever it changes height from one cliff height to another, it's going to add in a cliff kind of like that. What's that? Be right back. So I'm yeah, probably is, right? Well, good for you though, learning, man. It takes a while to to learn programming and learn music or whatever you want to learn. But if I would give some tips on on getting to um Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's old school Marshall. If you know, you probably if you know the amps, you probably know what that thing sounds like. It's from the '70s, super old. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember Sumas. Yeah, I remember you being on the stream the other day. Nice, cool. Uh, Steph M K. Um, let me show you. So far in the game, um, since last week, we've got this new boss to fight. So this guy's pretty much finished for now. So um, he's pretty difficult to fight because um, he just has tons of health and he, it's really easy for him to hit you. But there's these new um, health containers. You can pick up some health. I can make this guy a little more difficult, actually. I probably will. But he has already got me down to one heart of health, so... There we go. So yeah, that boss is done, and now I'm working on Perlin Noise for... Um, for dynamically generating, or procedurally generating, an overworld map with varying terrain heights. So, like, this darker stuff here in the bottom will be um will be water and these top these lighter parts will be mountains nice well uh sumis if i could give you any advice on getting to like a status of being a game developer as fast as possible i would pick pick a certain language and or engine whatever way you want to approach it Pick a game engine, ultimately. You're, ultimately, you're just picking a game engine that you want to work with. Learn that game engine and stick with it. So, like, for example, I have I learned um, C++ and, um, and I've always stuck with C++. There's a lot of other languages out there these days, though, that are great for making games. But it'll save you a lot of time if you pick, you know, like one art software and just stick with it. One music software and stick with it one programming environment and stick with it because it takes so long just to learn the software you know just to learn the ins and outs of a game engine just to learn the ins and outs of how to do how it does sprites how a game engine does music how it how to get around the bugs in the game engine there's so many little things to learn and get familiar and comfortable with that it's a lot of waste of time if you keep on switching engines so my recommendation is to stick with one so i hope that helps Hmm. Yep. I agree. Unity is a pretty good choice for most people to get started with. Nice. Cool. Um, I think C++ is actually one of the one of the best languages you can possibly learn in game development because it's so widely used um, and has been for so long. So, like, I learned C++ in the 1990s, almost 20 years ago, and it's still a great asset for me. So, I really don't think you can go wrong learning C++. 
and C++ is pretty similar to C, C sharp. So you're, you're going to be kind of learning both. Nice. Okay. So I'm going to get to adding in these cliffs. So as it changes from different heights, it's going to add in these little cliffs, but only for the mountaintops at first. So actually I'm going to do one thing where it just sets the image height or if it's So I'm going to set the, the bottom ones to be blue for water, actually, first, just to make that kind of apparent. So if C is less than or equal to colors, no, 255 over colors, then we're going to do a blue pixel. Otherwise, we're going to do the C pixel. So this is going to be blue, so something like just 0, 0, 255. So I've got this set up so it just runs it whenever my game generates a, um, its world. So I'm just running the game once really quick and then going off and reloading the Perlin noise generated to see what happened. Okay, good. All those are now blue representing water a little bit more betterly. Cool. Nice. Um, DM John, uh, if you're struggling with art, check out the From Programmer. You might have already heard me say this before, so but I'm just saying it just in case you haven't. But I wrote a thing called For Programmer to Artists, and it's particularly for people that have good programming skills but they struggle with art. So if you just search for from programmer to artist, it'll take you to wizardfood.com slash book slash from programmer to artist. Yeah, that's true. Nice. Okay, so cliffs. Do, as it goes from the top heights to the others. So we're going to say auto C equals data offset. And then auto, no, let's not use offset. Let's use the XY. So this is going to be Y times width plus X. And then C, and this is um, below, equals Y minus 1. We're going to have to do this. If Y equals, oh, no, we can just skip Y 0. So Y equals 1 through height. Now, if C not equal to below. Make a simple cliff. C is not equal to below, then let's just do this too. If C is greater than zero, and so that way we're going to set all the cliffs to just be zero color for now.
So this is going to be data y minus 1, blah, 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 equals 0. I think that might work. Let's see. So I just generated the noise. Now I'm going to go back and look at it again. Oh, yeah, it worked. And it even worked for the top parts, too. Very cool. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool, man. You'll get it, Sumus. It takes a lot of familiarization time to get used to everything. Okay, in fact, this might be good enough to actually start doing this in the game with the overworld just to see how this is feeling. Making all these blue parts water, the black parts cliffs or just rocks, and the other parts are just basically going to be not anything but dirt for now. And then filling in the gaps with trees. Okay, so let's try this out. Um, we're going to need for Perlin noise class here to have sort of a generate terrain style function. So could as well, might as well do it here in unsigned card data. Uh, am I picking the pixels out to paint the map in code? I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Um, I'm basically just generating some Perlin noise, and then um, I'm using this is entirely generated in code. So I'm I'm doing it here. I'm showing it in Photoshop though, so that I can mess with it a little bit and show you guys visually what the heck is going on, and also show myself visually what's going on. Nice, yeah. Now that's actually a great use for code. It's generating terrain, for sure. Okay, so it's gonna need to generate, let's see, let's make it a vector. That's probably the best container type for the data, so. We're gonna go generate, void generate, and then a vector, unsigned car, ref, data. So generate, we'll do this, and it'll generate all this data. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm already doing that generate. True. OK, so I'm using generate right now which basically just generates the width, height, So really, this actual method right here needs to turn into something better. Instead of it being a static void test method, this really should be a static void um, generate terrain. And it should return. Now I should fill up a vector unsigned car data with height colors. And it doesn't need a const string dest. And also one last thing, static void, 
save image based on data. So this can all be sort of flexible and modularized. Const string ref file name. Cool. So I think these two methods are going to be what's what it will use. Mm, nice. Yes, yeah, I assume it's of course. Post a video or a link anytime you want. Okay, so now we've got a generate terrain method. Actually, I'm just going to call it terrain. Yeah, generate terrain. I, just, I think it's, it's so similar to this other one. This other method is called generate. I guess you could just call it make terrain. Whatever. Okay. Make terrain. Cool. So this is going to be two separate methods. Fueled by ramen. I like it. Cool, man. So you did this, um, this basically just is randomly generated terrain or procedurally generated terrain for a, it's like this little roguelike game. It's cool. Good work, man. Done in Unity as well. Nice work, man. Nice. Cool. Lunch done. Next task. <laughs> Is that jet brains? Looks like jet brains. Nice. Come on. Show me the game though. Oh, there it is. Cool. Oh, we're making music too! Yay! What are you using here? Music and sound done! Making a cup of tea! <laughs> I love this! Cool, okay. This is like a platformer? Nice work, long, sh long shorts. Scavenger beneath the surface. Cool. Nice work, both you guys. Seriously, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot. Of, it takes a lot of time just to get things like that done. What's up, Sean? Hello. Welcome to the stream. We're making procedurally generated overworld terrain.
We don't need that. There we go. So we don't need this. Um, yeah, so Sean, right now I'm basically, I've got an algorithm that creates this, um, Perlin noise, which originally looks like this. So this is like what it looks like at phase one and phase two, it turns it into, it thresholds all, all of it into different levels. And then phase three, it actually adds on these little black pixels to do different terrain, like cliff height terrain. Yep. Yeah. Oh, cool. I didn't know Live GDX had a web player. Well, of course it probably would, right? Press E to begin. Yo. What do I do? Oh, is it Wazad? Oh, it's Wazad. Wazad. I died. <laughs> okay, so, oh, cool. Is it randomly selecting levels or randomly generating levels? I'm guessing it selects levels because I saw you draw, um, drawing some. Oh, I gotta pick up bullets? Is that what it is? Space? Oh, space. It totally is, right? Stuff happens when you're... Um... Dude, but what's what's great about this is you made this man and then how many how long did you spend on this oh. <laughs> oh look how many guys there are right here oh hunger's an issue I just I didn't even notice so okay cool we have hunger oh. I'm trying I'm struggling with doing it all left-handed I just want to kill one of these guys. Yeah! Got you! Nice. I'm fulfilled. Nice, dude. Yeah, but I don't know how long you spent on that, but I know that it takes a lot of time just to get that far. Um, games are no, not an easy thing to do. So way to go, dude. You might think, oh, it's crap, but really, that's a really good start towards something. And, um, yeah, you can't judge yourself on aesthetics, especially in, yeah, only 48 hours, dude. Tell them, like, if you spend a whole year making a game kind of like that, you'd be, you'd make an awesome game. So that's the, that's the thing. Okay, so I'm getting back to this. I'm making terrain. I'm generating, putting this into separate methods. So we don't need this anymore. We can go data dot pushback. Um, n. We don't need offset anymore because we're now in a vector. We can add in cliffs. And then this little bit can be a different method in itself. So void, Perlin noise, save image using taking a vector data and also a file name to output it. So we're going to go, yeah, this is going to be good having these as separate methods. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a second to keep coding here for a minute before I check some more links. Um, so, okay. Um, image data. And we need the width and height as well. Oh, we, no. Image data is just data.size times four. 
and then int offset. Oh, actually, we can just do for auto ref character in data. This is ah, I love it when I love it when code gets more simple. Code just falls away, and stuff like this happens where you just don't need as much. Oh, so save image is also going to need need the number of colors, and in fact. Hmm. Yeah, we'll take we'll just pass that in. So it's gonna be save image data file name unsigned colors. There. So we've got this um, data size times four once again, width height eight bits for pic per pixel. Oh, we do need width and height. Oh man. Okay, width height colors. And now in the game or in the world, I'm actually calling this so I can do Perlin noise, make terrains. This is all setting it up. So vector, unsigned car, data, and then Perlin noise, make terrain, data with height colors, with height colors. Save image data, file name with type colors. Okay, so if everything is still working as it as it should, then I'll get this image refreshed when I run it. Good. All right, still everything works just the same, so awesome. Nice. And YouTube has gotten so many more ads lately. Ooh, Unity's got a new logo. Sweet man. Dude, you're pretty far along in game development for only like just getting started. Seriously, this is some good work, man. Awesome. Yes, totally. Um, it is. Um MetaZelda is totally open source, so just search for MetaZelda. First link that comes up for me is the GitHub, which is open source. So it's right here, github.com, T. Coxon, T-C-O-X-O-N, MetaZelda. And that's his, um, it's JavaScript, or not JavaScript, but Java source code. And um, he, and so like if you're writing in a different language though, I would recommend just following through on this link to his website where he goes through and talks about how he actually does it. So yeah, there you go. So, okay, the next step is going to be taking this and actually turning it into terrain data that the game can use. 
In fact, I think probably the best thing to do is to turn these actually into actual methods instead of static methods. Now that, I, now that I'm thinking about it, so there should be like an image data or a terrain data as well. So let's call this terrain because I want to want to do an easy methods from this to be able to get a certain pixel for a certain area. So when this actually gets exported, there's going to be like, this is going to be one area in the top left. Here's going to be one area. Like this one here in the bottom is going to be zero, zero. This one is one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four, zero. Basically, I need a nice method to be able to get that data and see what tile is what. And so the best thing to do is going to be store this all in this Perlin noise class and make some nice methods to get at it. So, and also it's going to make these method calls less duplicating, less um, less coupling. It's called coupling when you are doing stupid stuff like that. So I'm going to go unsign with height and colors. All these are going to be saved. And save image doesn't need that. We can do this. And the last thing is going to be this. It's going to be unsign car get, get terrain type. In fact, this should be, should be an int get terrain for int area x, int area y, int x, int y. Const. Save image is also const. There, so that's going to make it easy to get at. Ah, cool. Glad you love Java. Yeah, of course, you're using LiveGGX. So, yep, it's Java. You're probably rejoicing right now. All right, so make terrain is no longer going to need that's yeah, vector. Oh, first thing I'm going to do is before I forget, I'm going to make sure and set colors to to one or zero. Something simple up here. I'm just do one colors equals one, and then when we make a gen when we generate things, we're going to set the colors. Okay, so make terrain. Oh, make terrain doesn't even need this either. So we're gonna, the first call is gonna be generate. Mm. Here we go, just generate. Yeah, so make terrain does not need any of this stuff anymore. It just makes a terrain variable. Sweet. All right, and we not we're not creating it like that. We're doing this skit now. All right, and we've already got the the data the terrain. Data. Oh, this is not data. This is now terrain. Terrain up pushback. This is terrain. All 
All right, cool. So that will save. Oh, save to file using the file name passed in. And this is sort of like a con. This is like a. We go like that. And the last method is going to be int Perlin noise get terrain. Oops. And uh, this is also a const. And then int offset equals Uh, we're going to need area width as well. Hmm. Cool, man. It's a great way to learn. Okay, so we've got area x times area width plus area y Now area Y is just times width. Okay, so that's cool. We don't need, yeah, area Y, no, area times width times area height. Plus Y times Actually, we can just go area Y times area height. Now let's do this, this is like a little bit, break this up into two lines so it's a little more simple. So offset equals that, offset plus equals area Y times area height plus Y and all of that times width. And then finally, offset plus equals X. I think that's going to create the right offset. So think over that one more time. Um, area X times area width. Yeah. Plus area Y times area height plus Y. Yeah, that's right. Plus X. Cool. So all of that just we do just return terrain offset. And also this if terrain dot size is less or if offset is less than terrain dot size return terrain offset. Otherwise we're just just return zero. Or negative one actually. That's probably more well, right. Okay, there. So now we've got we've broken this up into a couple more methods. We've got a, a simple method which actually gets any terrain pixel based on area 
positions. So now the world can pass a Perlin noise variable whenever it's creating the actual areas. So we've got Perlin noise, Perlin noise P, PN, PN.generate with height. colors and then pn dot make terrain we go and then pn.save image and then one last thing I want to do one check into a single pixel let's see if it's actually the right pixel so pn.get terrain for area X, zero, area Y, zero, area width, 21, area height, 20, X, 10, 10. So this should be returned the 10th pixel by the 10th pixel. Just gonna be black or blue. All right, so two things. One, it should refresh this image, and it should be exactly the same as before. And two, it should tell me that the pixel is black or blue. I'm not sure which one. Oops. Okay, so I definitely did something wrong here. So everything got messed up with the terrain. See what happened with the pixel. Pixel zero. Well, that was right. Okay. So what went wrong? Here it is, or part of it. Terrain, terrain. I don't think that would have fixed the, bu the bug, but let's see. Okay, so checking this out. Whoops, wrong one. Oh, yeah, that was it. Nice. What's up, Classic Bold Thunder? Classic Bold Thunder. Nice name, man. Love it. Great. Okay, so we've got the terrain working again. Yay. And let's see what pixel it returned for that one little test. And then we'll test another pixel to make sure that's right. Pixel equals 212. So that means, oh, that's, that seems wrong. 
Oh, that's because Y's are flipped. Okay, so why I need to flip all the Y's. Yeah, of course, man. So this is now the maximum Y minus all of the Y. So the maximum Y is going to be Oh, it's just height. So height minus all this stuff. Um, I'm using Xcode right here to code. And it's a free software from Apple. And I love it. And I'll probably never switch to another IDE because I believe it takes a lot of time to learn different software and I think that it's a lot it's a big waste of time to switch software a lot of the time so um and I learned on my own from books and I learned 20 years ago so everything I learned is kind of out of date the books I read are out of date so there's today it's so much easier to learn to program when I learned to program it was MS DOS you had to plug into a freaking interrupt just to get the time for your game so like Today's games, like, it's so easy to get the time. I can just go, in my game, I got a, a function which gets the time. So easy. Back then, you had to write, like, an entire class worth of information just to get the time from your from your computer's little crystal, which vibrated. Dude. So anyways, it was like walking both ways uphill in the snow to school back then. Let, let Grandpa tell you for a second how hard it was used to be to code. <laughs> I'm joking, man. But it really, really is a lot easier to make games these days. There's so many great tools. And if you're just starting out, I would recommend Unity or Game Maker or Unreal Engine or something like that. So, yeah, there you go, man. Um, this game's called Songbringer. It's a Zelda-like action adventure RPG. You've got... Um, this is the main hero. And this is a boss right here. He's fighting one of the first bosses in the game. Um, it's like a item based progression so you you get different items in the game and they allow you to do different stuff so there's no experience points it's not like a true RPG it's more of an adventure and that's it right now I'm working on generating Perlin noise for um, for the terrain so I started with this it's Perlin noise generator and now it's I've gotten in down to this where it's got threshold and different terrain values and cliffs. And now I'm finally putting it into the actual game. So let's see if that height minus all of that worked to give it that yeah, pixel equals 42. Good. Now if I do a couple more pixels up. Thanks. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so if I, do, if I do a little more up in those pixels, so what would this, this be if I were to grab that pixel there, height 25, so I'm just going to look for pixel 25, Y, and see if that is one more pixel up, and then I know that, pretty sure that the get terrain function here is working, and then I can apply that all to the actual overworld terrain and use it to generate some actual procedurally generated terrain good pixel 85 good I do believe that's working now so I'm going to take away this test that test right yeah DM John I know what you mean Okay, so now I'm going to be passing a Perlin noise into the area when it gets set up so that it knows. Knows how to do its terrain. So Perlin noise ref.
think that'll work. Let's see. When the area gets set up, here it is. All oh, right, it doesn't actually generate the tiles, so it calls the generate tiles method. And pattern home, pattern sort, pattern random, all these are going to need to get the noise. So the best thing actually, instead of passing it in, having to pass it down to all these different functions, I'm just going to make it so the Perlin noise is a member of the world for the overworld terrain. And so those are like the mazes. We're going to do Perlin noise overworld terrain and then this is going to be static Perlin noise get terrain let's call this terrain there now it's accessible only needs to be generated once by the world. We need a get terrain method. And that can be const as well. So it should be const. Const per the noise. Alright. Now we got const per the noise ref world get terrain turn world dot terrain good and now when we're creating this world it's just gonna be terrain dot generate and all that so terrain dot generate wait there's one bit that actually sets the size here it is Create overworld terrain, and then this is going to be terrain.generate, and the 16 right here can now be pulled from the actual sizes 0.x. This is sizes 0.y, and then the 20 and this 21 are the actual area widths. Where do I get those? Okay, we've got these just hard coded, so I'm gonna make those no longer hard coded. You know, I was gonna make them here in this global constants file, but really, I've always wanted some areas to be bigger than others. I know that doesn't make any sense from an actual spatial mindset but I think it be, could be really cool to be trippy kind of for some levels to just be gigantic or some areas individual areas so I'm gonna do I'm just gonna set a const in for now so area width is 21 area height is 20 this is like a default area width default area height And all these 20s and 21s, I'm going to use the constant now. Okay, area width. Oh, but now. Oh, yeah, the area knows. Okay, so the area is going to already have this constant, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay, area height. And the number of colors. Let's actually set that to be a constant as well. Const int k terrain thresholds equals six
Okay, terrain thresholds. Good. I'm going to add one more little bit of code here. So it makes sure to only run saving out this debug file in debug mode. There. And now, here's one area to set up. So, K area width, K area height. Here's the other one. Okay, so that now I'm just going to verify that everything is still running, the build is still good. And then the last step is going to be hooking it up so all this purlin noise, thresholded terrain and cliffs and all that actually gets turned into tiles for the overworld. So let's make sure it still runs. Yep, okay, we're all good there. And let's make sure the purlin noise is still exactly as it was. Okay, it's not. I messed something up. That's pretty weird. Okay, so what? Oh, man. What did I do? What did I do? Oh, first thing to check is where it's actually generating. So all of this, if I were to just set this back to what it was, maybe I did some of these constants wrong. So I'm gonna set it backwards here. This was 21 or 16 times 21. And this was eight times 20, and this was six. So if this works, then I know I messed up some of these constants somewhere. Okay, it didn't. Hmm. It's definitely a weird effect. It's almost like the height is off by one or something. Hmm, how did this happen all of a sudden? Hmm, obviously if, if the width and the height got off, or somehow the terrain, yeah, if the terrain got generated wrong, or has too many pixels in it, then this last method here can get totally off. So I'm going to set this back to width times height. This also is going to be width times height. And then also this is going to be going for looping over X and Y. Yeah, totally is, totally is. But you know, um, I don't know, I find that the best way to debug, for me at least, is to just relax. You know, it's easy to freak out when I'm when I'm live streaming and I'm encountering bugs like this because I'm, I'm live. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm supposed to be some guy programming this stuff and other people are watching me program and it's like, I should be good. I should know how to fix these bugs. But really, bugs happen to everybody. You know, it's not like, it's not like I'm some special person that's never going to have bugs. So the thing is, I got to relax on it, 
you know, not worry so much that um, basically that you guys can see me in a vulnerable state. I'm in a vulnerable state right now where I am, I have no clue, <laughs> you know? So relaxing. And then if, you know, if I can't figure it out on a stream or whatever, there's, there's times definitely where I get frustrated and I know I have no clue what's going on. So um, later on, I'll just come back to it. You know, I'll take a nice break, come back to it later and almost always totally fine after that. So we've got y times width plus x. In fact, this could just be offset. Oh, no worries, no worries. Yeah, totally DM John. I know exactly what you mean. Totally, it's trial and error for me a lot of times too. I'm like, I have no idea. I'll just try it until it works. And eventually I try and try and try and it does work. Make these crazy breakthroughs. Okay, so there, it's still not working, even though I rewrote all this to be right on, maybe, let's try that. Definitely, there's a lot of code, bits of code that can be really, really difficult to debug, but yeah. Yeah, totally. Just building HTML forms can take forever. Ah, yeah. Well, hopefully this is inspiring for some of y'all to be like, all right, cool. This is how, you know, if he can do, if he can do procedural terrain and rivers and stuff, I can do it too. And that's kind of what this is all about. Nice. Okay, so none of this worked. What if I went int offset equals this? Check that. Oh, I hear you. I'm making a website in my spare time too, man. I have to basically make some income, so I'm I'm doing a website to um to make some income until I get my Kickstarter off the ground. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna make the I'm gonna stop making assumptions here. That's a good thing when you're when you're debugging, is you make assumptions. The biggest assumption I was making right there is okay, was it even outputting the Perlin.ping? So I'm gonna run. If it outputs the Perlin up ping, good. That assumption is now no longer an assumption. Okay, good. So it was outputting the ping. It is still doing terrain heights. That's good. But it's doing this weird offset. So Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm almost there. What? I, yeah, what? I definitely. Okay, so that's an issue too with my my own. Like, I'm worried that um, 
that my video is not going to be good enough or that I'm basically just worried that my Kickstarter will fail and I've got to get over those fears and just put it out as good as I've got it. You know what I mean? So I'm giving myself like this last week to basically put together as much cool stuff as I can. I think the overworld is going to be a cool thing to show in the video. So showing bits of the overworld as it goes through the first bits of the video or something like that is going to be a cool thing to show people. Um, and so basically I just need to put it out there and I know that I can improve the video over the over the length of the Kickstarter. I can keep on improving the game and improve the video over time. So it'll get better. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting there. I think overworld and a little bit of narrative and maybe showing that there is items that can be upgraded in like a, a little shop would be cool things. It's just the basic mechanics of this game. Okay, so I'm going to start actually by removing bits of code that I've added lately. So now I'm commenting out the cliffs. Sweet, man. Thanks. So without the cliffs, still got the weirdness. So it wasn't the cliffs that did it. Um, let's comment out some other stuff. actually comment all of these the gradient the cone the threshold what's up Massey welcome to the stream yeah that's um I agree. The other day we were all talking about that. We were talking about how to whether to put her in or not, or how to put her in, things like that. And uh, just to, for context, if people are watching the stream, we're talking about this character. Um, let me open up that file. It's the second character for the game. This is the female character, and um, I'm pretty sure at this point she's going to be um, playable, but not. she's not going to have a sword. She's probably going to either shoot beams out of her eyes, or she's going to punch people. I'm not sure exactly how that'll work. And because it's a, it's primarily a Zelda-like game, it's, she's going to be sort of a, a limited second player. She might not even have health. She might be invincible. Hey, maybe, yeah. Um, so yeah, but that's a really good thought, Massey, and I actually um, thought about that already as well, and I think that's a great Kickstarter stretch goal. So like that probably should be the first stretch goal is like, okay, if we hit $9,000, that's that means the game is going to get done. That's the bare minimum for the, for the Kickstarter. That'll give me six months of living expenses to basically finish this game. Um, but above $9,000, if we hit like 15, maybe it's co-op play. So the first, first stretch goal is co-op play. She's playable and basically dialing in the game so that all the bosses work with her added and players can basically just enjoy that co-op style. So good thoughts as usual, Massey. Thank you. Um, Black Iron, welcome back. And um, we are currently working on procedurally generated overworld terrain. And there's a little bug with the system. Everything was working fine there a second ago and all of a sudden it didn't. It's not working anymore. So this is what the Perlin noise is supposed to look like. And it's looking like this. It's like staggering it all, which means it's somewhere in there. It's adding in like one extra pixel per line or something. So I'm trying to figure out what the heck it is. I just commented out some more code. So I'm going to comment it, or run this.
So it's still got that staggered look, even though even though I've commented out all of this stuff too. So it's not it's like it's almost not even in this make terrain method. It might be with the either the actual data or drawing it. Good, well that's good to know. That's cool. Um, I, I'm actually really excited. I actually designed this game primarily to be a co-op game at first. And I originally thought that I would write an AI and she would be on screen at all times and AI controlled when you didn't have a second player. But I really think that drop-in co-op is probably better and actually human controlled co-op is, is better. So I kind of like the idea of that single player mainly, so you get to play as this guy and then just drop in co-op so a player can join. If you have another friend, she can play this. And she kind of works, her mechanics work a little bit differently. So she's probably going to be invincible. And she can only affect enemies in different ways. She can't actually hurt other enemies. She can only, like, stun. Or she can maybe only, um, you know, do simple things that a second player... Because usually if you're the second player, you're somebody that is usually not the primary player, not the not the best player. So the, if you're the primary player, you're like, oh, should I add the second player? Well, it's not going to hurt me at all to add the second player. So that's why she would be sort of a playable, but sort of invincible. All right, man, good night. OK, so what the heck? It's either in its output well, I just I just went through and verified that it's probably not the output because I did all this by hand again. Yes, exactly. Like knockback kick or stun. Yeah, knockback would be actually be a pretty good one. And also other items too. So the game could have multiple items that give her abilities as well. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It all all depends on the implementation, whether the support player is useless or overpowered. But it is cool to um to wonder. Interesting. Yeah. So I, you know that's a really good, really really good debate. So if you guys if you do have any thoughts on it, I I am like ask, um, asking for thoughts on my TIG source thread. So if you're on forums.tig source and you go to the dev logs and you search for Songbringer, that's the current debate right now is whether to go co-op or not. So the last page is all about that. So people have actually shared some really, really good thoughts about on what their preference is on co-op. So stoked about stoked to get so much help and feedback from the community. It's great. Okay, one thing I want to hit this. I'm going to set a breakpoint here. I'm just going to make sure that width and height are good values because that could mess up everything. Width 336. 21 times 16, 336. Okay. The width is good. Height, 160. Should be 8 times 20. Yeah, it is 8. I know it's 160. Okay. So, yeah, we're good to, we're good to go there. Um, let's see data size, actually. Data size and terrain size. They're both exactly the same. So that should be width times height, 336 times 160. Interesting. Did I do that wrong? 
336 times 160. Okay, yeah. So yeah, they got the exactly the right number of elements as well. So something is causing that crazy offset. It's like I missed something really key. And I, it's like when, when I wasn't even working on that part of the code, all of a sudden it started doing this. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. Good perspective. Thanks. It's always good to hear it from from other people's um, point of view. What your friend's gaming situations like. My personal situation is um, I don't live near my friends anymore, so that's why we don't do co-op as much. So that's why I kind of enjoy these single player games. Okay, so I'm going to log the lowest, highest, and the data size right here after generating this first bit. Man, I hate this keyboard. Data dot size, lowest, highest. Hmm. Okay. Oh, nice. Uh huh. Yeah, I gotta. I really gotta get into my, get into playing more games with my friends. They all play Dota still. I'm not really a Dota player. Interesting. So this highest value. It's usually one, and this time it's not one, but okay. I'm going to actually turn off the normalization. What the heck? Let's see if this theory is correct on it being one pixel off. So if I grab one exact pixel line here, if I can, There. Zoom in and see if this lines it up. There. 
I shifted it one to the left. And no, it did not line it up perfectly. There's one value here. In fact, it's going to be way easier if I turn back on all of this um, thresholding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Multiplayer does make it more fun when you're playing with your friends. Even if it's a bad game. Okay. Back to this update. All right. If I grab one pixel line. Yeah, okay, so it's definitely not that. It's not exactly off by one pixel. That seems like it. Mm -hmm. It's good to know about customer habits for sure. And, and it's good to, for you guys to be sharing it with me right now because um, that's right where I'm at. I'm at the point where I'm about to market this or start marketing it in a sense. I believe you should start marketing your game from day one and that's kind of why I'm streaming. Man, I have no clue. I have no clue what the hell happened to this Perlin noise generator all of a sudden. As soon as I put it in this other method. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna go with a kind of a different strategy here. I'm renaming the variable which I use to store all the data into datas. Because I know I had for at one point I had data, two different data variables. So I'm gonna call this datas, and everywhere that it was using it, it will now be an error. So I can go back and just call these datas. And so I can I can verify that I'm using datas in the right places. All right, it was only using it in the places where I thought it was already.
You know what? One thing I did change. I didn't have a call that was like this, like let's actually uncomment this until I get it. That, just that, grabbed a single pixel. Wasn't it either? Uh, yeah, I stand up while I work. Um, I stand up and I sit down a lot too. But um, mostly when I stream, I stand up. Mostly the beginning of my day, I stand up. And then as I get more tired and tired, I um, sit down more. Oh, dude. Uh, just lost that code I wrote. Hmm. Uh, well, you know what? This is one of those things where I'm basically just going to have to stop the stream, take a break. Figure it out. This Perlin noise used to look like this. And this is what I'm using to generate terrain. I'm using this to generate overworld terrain for the game. And now all of a sudden the terrain started looking like this. And it's doing this like staggered weirdness. And I don't I have no clue why. And I've just been I've checked over all the code like twice, looking at it all again and again and again. I have no clue why it's doing it. So I gotta take a break. That's what I gotta do to solve this debugging issue. So, um, yeah. So sorry, this this stream was so code heavy and bug ridden, but I hope it helps somebody out there. So tomorrow, I'll I'll probably have already fixed this by tonight. And tomorrow, what I'm what I'm basically gonna be doing is taking this code or this terrain and making tiles out of it for the game. So where where um one tile transitions to another, I'm gonna start I'll adding I'll be adding like these cliffs, and the cliffs will turn into rocks in the game. And wherever there's not cliffs, there will be trees, bushes, caves, secrets, water. The little blue areas are water. So that's what it's all about. Exactly. I'll be on the toilet, I'll be like Yes, I got it. Oh yeah. <laughs> so anyways, um yeah. Thanks a lot guys. That's the end of this stream for today.